Inside this box is a mysterious item. It's an item that no one has ever seen before. I haven't even seen it. And after I show it to you, no one will ever see it again. It's a bold claim. Are you interested what's inside the box? What's your name? Chris. Chris wants to know what's inside the box. I dare say many of you also want to know what's inside the box. Chris, I'm going to show you what's inside the box in just a moment. But let's make this a little more interesting. Let's just, I tell you what, I tell you what we'll do. Um, in just a second, I will show you what's inside the box. But in the, idea, the, in the pursuit of ideas worth spreading, let's make this a friendly little uh, wager. If I show you something that I have just described, at the next break, and after all those next speakers, would you be willing to buy me a drink out at the bar? With the caveat that if I have misspoke, misspoken, if I have said anything that lied to you at all, that I would buy your drink. We would uh, be, one of us is going to buy a drink. Fair enough? Fair little, uh, fair little, all right, very good. Inside this box, I have a, uh, a peanut in a shell. If I actually take the actual nut out of the shell, Chris, nobody's ever seen this nut before. <laughs> Not even me. And now that you've seen it, <laughs> no one will ever see it again. <laughs> uh, that, my friends, is the perfect example of a proposition bet. Now, some of you would call that a bar bet, and it is, but technically it's called a proposition bet because... The, the hustler or the con artist makes a bold or outrageous claim. He then draws you in and makes you think about what he's claimed, maybe even doubting what he's uh, saying that he can do. And then he does exactly what he was saying he was going to do because he has some sort of obscure or specialized knowledge that you don't have. They call it the hook, the line, and the sinker. So what we're going to do over the next few moments is I am going to share with you the psychological aspects of a scam. You see, a con artist or a hustler is really just a street psychologist. They understand how to manipulate a situation so that you are willing to take your wallet out of your pocket and put your money down on what appears to be a sure bet. So as I said, I'm going to describe to you, I'm going to explain to you what draws you in what entices you to take action, and what ultimately will empty your bank account. Again, it's called the hook, the line, and the sinker. So let's take a look at the mysterious item inside the box. The hook. I come out and claim, bold claim, there's an item inside this box no one's ever seen before, and no one ever will ever see again. The line. I let you think about it for just a moment. I even go so far as to make you maybe doubt a little bit about what I'm claiming. And then I uh, suggest perhaps a friendly little wager. And the sinker, I do exactly what I said I was going to do, and I collect my winnings. And by the way, if you want to buy me that drink, that will be totally fine with me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> But of course, none of us would ever actually fall for a scam, would we? I mean, we're all too intelligent for that, right? Let me tell you a little story. When I was a kid, I used to have this romantic vision in my mind of what it must be like to be a hustler or a professional gambler. I bought books with titles like Games You Can't Lose, How to Be Treated Like a High Roller, Even Though You're Not One, and a treatise on the sucker effects of the three-card Monty. And for some strange reason, the idea of being able to live off your cleverness or your wits alone was very enticing to me. When I got out of college, uh, my very first job was for a mortgage company. Uh, every so often, one of the... Yeah, exactly, right? Uh, every so often, one of the uh, real estate brokers that did a lot of business with my, uh, the company I was a part of, they would come, he would come in and he would talk about these quick de turnaround deals that he was doing that was making him a bunch of money. And once he brought it up, every time he came, up, uh, came in over the next several weeks, he would tell me about all the money he was making. He had even gone so far as to bring in one of the uh, loan originators who was uh, in the office there on some of the deals, and they were making money together. That was the hook. One day, the loan originator came to me and said, hey, this real estate broker is interested in, wants to know if you would like to participate in one of these real estate deals. And I said I was interested. Uh, she said, well, if you invest $9,000, in 30 days, you will get back a check for $10,600. Now, being just out of college, I didn't have any money. And I, I told her that. And she said, oh, I totally understand. But if you're really serious, you could uh, go to the bank and take out a loan. 
My response was, well, I, I don't think they're going to give a guy with no collateral a uh, $9,000 loan for partial ownership in a piece of property that we're going to try to flip. So I, I just don't know if that would work. And she said, you know what, you're probably right. But if you're actually serious about being an investor, then you can tell them that you're going to take it out for furniture. So I did. That was the line. The sinker was that after I gave them a $9,000 check, uh, more or less, they skipped town, both of them. You see, the two had become romantically involved and had acted together as a team. To make matters worse, they would af often call me and give me what appeared to be perfectly legitimate reasons for why the piece of property had not sold. It took me a while, but sooner or later, I finally figured out I was going to be paying on a $9,000 loan for the next several years of my life. According to the Justice Department, Americans lose billions and billions of dollars every single year due to fraud. Uh, in fact, according to the FBI, they put out a report that said in 2011, uh, Americans lost $485 million in online scams alone. If you want to talk about Medicare fraud, uh, Medicare doesn't even have an exact estimate on how much they lose uh, due to fraud. However, if we look at FBI estimates again, they estimate that between 3 and 10% of all health care claims are fraudulent. And if we apply that math, that means between 17 and $57 billion are lost by the American public every single year due to Medicare fraud. If you think about all the different types of fraud that are out there, the numbers are are absolutely staggering. So I guess the question is, how is it that uh, really intelligent people fall for scams? Well, in the book Slight of Mind, the uh, neuroscientists uh, Stephen Macknick and Susanna martinez Condi they wrote this book, Slight of Mind. They are from the Barrow Neurological Institute in uh, Phoenix, and they write about a fellow neuroscientist named Paul Zak, who is one of the leading authorities on the neurobiology of trust. Now, according to Paul Zak, the key to a con is not so much that you trust the con artist. The key to a con is that the con artist shows that he or she trusts you. And when you feel trusted, your brain releases oxytocin. And when your brain releases oxytocin, you reciprocate that trust naturally. You see, oxytocin is the hormone that is released in a childbirth, breastfeeding, social recognition, and cooperation. According to Zach, when you cooperate, when you help someone, it makes you feel really, really good. Quote, unquote, I need your help as a potent stimulus for action. If we take a look at why Bernie Madoff's uh, Ponzi investment scheme worked, what we learn is that basically it worked because he created this air of exclusivity. You see, Bernie Madoff wouldn't just let anybody invest with him. No, he only let people invest with him that he trusted. And because he trusted, they could trust him in turn. You see, he frequented private clubs, exclusive establishments, and he created this uh, this sense of a very unique exclusive group. And by the time an investor was finally let into that world, their oxytocin circuits were firing all the way to the bank. They were. Uh, now, interestingly enough, of course, there are many different reasons why we get conned or why we get scammed, and oxytocin is just one. Uh, another common reason would be greed. So, that guy. <laughs> now, if you stop and think about it, okay, uh, oh, there, I tell you what, there's actually a really interesting, um, really interesting quote. It's a grifter's quote. It's an old quote by a con artist, and it says, you can't cheat an honest man. Now, what does that mean? Uh, let me explain to you what that, in fact, if you set an, uh, you know, a con artist down and you said, hey, um, how do you justify stealing someone's money? They would say you can't cheat an honest man. And here's the philosophy, here's the perspective behind that. They look at it as though the potential victim is actually getting ready to take advantage of them. You see, the way a con works is it sets up a situation where uh, the entire, uh, the way that the potential victim views it is that everything is in their advantage. They can see that they have every advantage and that they are actually going to take the con artist's money. And the con artist's perspective is that if they can see all of that, that they're not being honest and they're going to steal the con artist's money for their own greed. And that is the reason why they are they're more than happy to justify stealing your money or someone else's money by saying you can't cheat an honest man. Now, it's important to understand as well that uh, 
that, that even though uh, I'm kind of outlaying, laying out for you the anatomy of a scam, how it works, that uh, unfortunately, there, as long as there are people around to think about figuring out how to take advantage of other people, there will be scams, and you can't completely control it, uh, and you can't completely protect yourself. However, uh, there are a few indicators that I will share with you uh, that should, if you find yourself in a situation where you may potentially be getting scammed, these should re set off red flags in your mind. Number one, a con artist is going to try to get you to participate in a situation where you are willing to give your money to them. The key word there is willing. You see, the police are going to have a hard time doing a whole lot about it if you willingly gave your money to somebody. Number two, again, like I said a moment ago, they're going to put a, create a situation that, puts you, that gives you an unfair advantage over everybody else, and they're going to try to get you to take advantage of the unfair advantage. Uh, consider this example. You probably aren't going to go to the police and tell the police that, hey, I was part of a local crew of people who were cheating at a card game, but somehow we messed up the cheat and lost all my money. Number three, they use a partner. And sometimes they use numerous partners, but uh, they always use a partner to act as your confidant. There has to be someone when you're on the fence who says, oh, I did it, or they're willing to put their money out there and bet or uh, invest or whatever. So if you see other people doing it, that is a very powerful reason for, hey, if they're doing it, I should be able to do it too. And also, lastly, uh, time sensitive. They're going to create this picture for you that is a picture of a, a perfect situation. And then they don't want you to think about it too hard because if you step away and use your critical thinking, you may decide not to participate. So they're going to create a situation where you have to act immediately. Now, as I said just a moment ago, unfortunately, I can't protect you or I can't give you everything because there's no way to truly protect yourself. If you were to walk out of here thinking that you couldn't get conned after listening to me talk, you're actually a much easier target to con. But it, now that you kind of understand the anatomy, the hook, line, and sinker, and now that you understand some of these indicators so that maybe the red la lights will go off in your mind if you find yourself in this situation, uh, hopefully you will be able to protect yourself just a little bit more. But I think the real question is, what would this actually look like in action, right? Well, I've given you some examples, but I'd like to share with you right now is I'd like to share with you what it actually really does look like in action. We asked, uh, uh, it, during the break, we asked a couple of people to participate. We have, uh, and uh, Ben, you can come out uh, with the camera, and we have Dustin, our, uh, you've been like the mascot for TEDx Nashville this year, uh, Dustin, and we have uh, uh, Scott, right? Scott, jo Scott, join me right over here uh, on this side. Uh, Dustin, you'll be right there. So what we're going to do and I'm going to share with you a street game. It's actually, um, you might see this played on the streets of uh, big cities. The idea of this game is called Chase the Ace. It's also kind of called Find the Lady. The technical name for it is the Three Card Monty. It uses three cards. Uh, and it, the two of those cards are similar. One card is different. The different card is called the Monte card or the money card. Okay, that's the one that you want to bet on if you were to put your money down. So I'll just kind of just kind of explain how this might actually work in action. So in fact, what they would probably do is they would probably draw you in with a nice little rhyme, and it might sound something like this. Inky dinky parlez-vous, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. A little game from Hanky Poo. The Joker's for me, the ace for you. Ladies and gentlemen, step right up. Step right up and learn the secrets of the ancients. Now, I'm going to leave out that snappy line of patter because I don't want to confuse anybody, if you know what I mean. So, what we'll do is I'll show you how this might work if you're walking by down the street. If you're walking down the street, the guy might always toss the exact same pattern. It would be simple, it would be methodical, it would be slow, so that you could always follow what's going on. The moment you stop and take your wallet out of your pocket, he's going to change the pattern. Do you see how it changed? does not affect where the ace goes, but the pattern itself does change. Now... In order to get you to actually bet, in order to get you to actually participate, he has to be willing to let you win. If you win on a small bet, you'll take the big money out of your pocket a little bit easier. So, uh, Dustin, will you help? All right, Dustin, here we go. I'm going to let you win this one. Give you a little hint there, Dustin. <laughs> Dustin, which one of those cards is the ace? 
Very good guess. Dustin, you win. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Dustin, you just won. That was a $10 bet, Dustin. You just won $10. And in fact, oh, I forgot to point this out, but remember this, Dustin, the ace always starts in the center uh, because if it doesn't start in the center, it can be a little bit hard to follow. Now, here's what I want you guys to understand. As I mentioned a moment ago, there are, th first off, uh, you have uh, a time-sensitive situation. He has to make a decision quickly. Second off, it's a situation where you're willing to get your money involved, that he's willing to participate. It's going to be tough to justify that later on. Third, partner. Here's what you don't know. The reason that this is actually a, uh, he can't win is because I have a partner that he doesn't know about. That's why I have two people up here. Uh, so what we're going to do here is uh, you're going to help me out. You're going to play as my partner, if that's all right with you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually have you, if he guesses correctly, you are going to, I'm going to give you a signal. I will call out. I will say <clears throat> like that. So if you guess you're correctly, I will go, <clears throat> and when I do that, all I'm going to need you to do is I'm going to need you to say, I double that bet. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay. So in other words, if he doubles the bet, because I only take one bet at a time, I would take his bet over yours. Now, you don't know that we're actually working together, so I'm paying a guy off that's on my payroll. So we're keeping the money between us. So you win one bet, and then you kind of start take out the big money, and that protects me and anybody else on my team from losing any big money. Fair enough? All right, so here we go. Dustin, are you ready? All right, here we go. All right, here we go. Dustin, watch very closely. Dustin, here we go. All right, Dustin, all right, all right. So I need a $20 bet to get this started. You willing to bet $20 on this, yes? You, all right, fantastic. <clears throat> I hear a double over here. That's fantastic. That's forty dollars to this gentleman right here. So I need a fifty dollar bet from you to get a little bit to cause now he's got it. Uh, are you willing to bet fifty dollars? Fantastic. Would you bet on this card, this card, or this card? <clears throat> I hear a hundred dollar bet over here. So which one which one would you be willing to bet on? This one right here, and ah, very good. That you win a hundred dollars, Sir Dustin. He's got confidence. You see, this, my friend, is a confidence game. You have to be willing to actually participate. You have to be willing to put your money on the table. So we're gonna do this one more time. Now the bet's now a hundred dollars. So we're gonna try one more time. Are you ready? All right, Dustin. Here we go. Here's the, here's the ace. Okay, so here we go. You know, you understand the situation, yes? So you're ready. All right, so here we go. All right, Dustin, pay close, close attention, just like so. Uh, I will go like this. I will go like this. I will go like this. I will try to confuse you just a little bit. I will make this very easy. Dustin, $100 bet to you. Are you willing to bet $100? <clears throat> double. I hear a double over here. That's 200 to this gentleman. Now, the only way you can actually win this game is if you come up with more money than the partner's got, because then he can't double the bet. So you got a hundred on it. Yeah, I don't even know. You probably don't have a hundred dollars, do you? That's okay. Um, yeah. I tell you what, I'll, I'll get you. I'll get you some more investors. Um, so we've got a hundred dollar bet here, and I've got a double over here. So I need. Uh, would you? Uh, would you be willing to bet? Put a fifty on it. So we're trying to. We're trying to get a fifty. All right, now I got a hundred fifty. Could I get a fifty from you? Maybe add in. Yes, another fifty. So that's two hundred. Let's add in one more. Can I get a hundred from you? Fantastic. I like that. No, no, absolutely not. Uh, that's very good. So now it's a $300 bet. But Dustin, even though you've got a lot of people participating here, only one person actually gets to bet, gets to pick the card. So Dustin, your choice, this card, this card, or this card. Pick it out. Hang on a second. Oh, wait, there's a bend in that card. Do you see that bend right there? That's weird. Hmm. I think a... All right, you know what? I'll take your bet anyway. And when I say I'll take it, I mean I'll take it. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the uh, three-card Monty. Thank you very much. Give them both a big round of applause. Thank you very much. You guys can go back. So here's your takeaway, the final thing for you to remember. If you find yourself in a situation that appears too good to be true, it probably is. Thank you, guys. My name is Jason Michaels. Have a great rest of the day.